the gospel lesson is taken from Matthew, Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you. So last week we began Easter morning with the women frightened at the tomb in Mark's gospel. And we ended on Easter night in John's gospel with all the disciples except Thomas and Judas huddled in a locked house, afraid that the authorities who executed Jesus would be coming for them next. Then Jesus showed up, breathed the Holy Spirit into them and said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. All that makes for quite a day. It also must have raised a lot of questions, like sent to do what exactly? Matthew's gospel clears up that particular question in the very last passage of that book. We have come to call what Adjua just read the Great Commission, Jesus' command to go into all the world and make disciples. Remember that the definition of a disciple is one who is learning to be like a master. In other words, a student. So disciples of Jesus are students of Jesus learning to be like Jesus. So Jesus here is indicating to his closest followers by telling them to go out and make disciples that they have now graduated. In this moment, they change from being disciples, those who are still learning, to being apostles, which means those who are sent out, those who are deployed. It's important to note that the Great Commission here in Matthew is not given to a broad public gathering. While lots of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances were unexpected and to random people, 500 people here, a couple of guys on a road over there, this one was a planned invitation-only event up on a mountain where Jesus tells his closest disciples, meet me up there. Which means the ones who should be making disciples baptizing and teaching them are the ones who have studied long enough and successfully enough to be sent out as apostles. It's apostles who do the work of Jesus to make disciples because supposedly they have learned. Making disciples is the job of the church writ large, but it's not the job of individuals still in the discipleship process themselves. If you remember, Jesus calls his 12 disciples three years before he allows them to graduate and become apostles. And they lived with him and traveled with him for the entirety of that three years. Only Judas failed to finish the training. And that wasn't because he sinned, that was because he quit. The other 11 are charged with growing the movement by forming and training communities full of people who want to live as Jesus did. That is, to make disciples. So that the vision of peace and loving community the Bible presents can come closer to reality. That's what church is supposed to be 
and do and create. A quick glance around the globe makes plain that the disciple-making project Jesus gave his nearest and dearest 2,000 years ago is not exactly a shining success. There are plenty of Christians. As of 2020, there were 2.5 billion of us worldwide. But are they all disciples? The words of Mahatma Gandhi ring sadly true. There are too many Christians who are not like our Christ. Something has gone terribly wrong in too many places. So it's worth going back to put ourselves in the shoes of those first disciples at their graduation ceremony. They are shifting from being disciples to making disciples. What did that mean for them? And what might that same project look like for us as a church? And maybe in that we can figure out where we as Christians and churches writ large have gone wrong. In a post last week on the meaning of Easter, Father Richard Rohr said that God's, God's job description was to turn death into life. And I agree with that. That's God's job. God made that job manifest in Jesus by turning death into life in his own body. Then with a breath, Jesus passed that job on to his disciples who passed it to the very first churches who sought to do the same on through the centuries and the millennia. All of it was in service to the grand biblical vision to create a world without threat or tears, pain or sorrow, the beloved community, all nations and people sharing in the love of God. It was never about a religion per se. It was instruction on how to live in a way that could make that hopeful vision a reality, not just in heaven, but in the here and now. And yet, here we sit, facing existential threats on several fronts. Death is front and center from the pandemic to war to planetary destruction. The job description passed to those of us who claim to be disciples, both as individuals and as churches, is to turn death into life. There's plenty of that death around for us to work with. What does it look like to do that job? How did Jesus do it? How did he teach his disciples to do it? And can we do even a piece of that now? I want to propose that there are three commands that Jesus gives his disciples that lay the groundwork for the job of turning death into life. We're going to look at each of them in way more detail across the next few weeks. These three things will be the subjects of the next three sermons to come. But this morning, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to describe each of the three things briefly. Then we're going to have some dialogue about them so that we can together begin to imagine what the new normal might look like here at Crawford. I'm going to explain that the dialogue piece in a minute. But first, to the three things I believe are necessary to turn death into life. The first is the central paradox of Christian faith. To have life, we have to embrace death. Jesus lived that out during Holy Week, but it was articulated as a command to his disciples in Matthew 16, verses 24 through 45. If 24 to 25. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, talk of resurrection is meaningless if there isn't death to begin with. And if we refuse to let anything die, nothing new can live. 
The truth of that is evident both in individual lives and in churches and other institutions. If we find ourselves stuck in some aspect of our lives, either as individuals or as a church, it's very likely because there's something that needs to die that we insist on keeping on life support. With all the energy going there, nothing is left for anything new. At the very heart of Christianity is the ability not only to face death, but to embrace it as the path, the, the only path to resurrection. Whether that's being willing to face our own mortality or to come to grips with other necessary endings in our lives. Embrace death. That's the first thing. And it's at the center. Second is the command Jesus gives at his last meal with his disciples when he ties a towel around his waist and washes the feet of the disciples. He then tells them to do the same for one another. We're not only to embrace death, we are to embody service, which is sometimes actually harder. The one who would be greatest must become the least. The first shall be last. That whole concept of service is throughout is throughout all of the Gospels, but it's embodied in that moment. We focus on the communion moment and take the broken body and take the shed blood, um, but we often push aside the washing each other's feet. Jesus said, do this for each other. Um, service. We're not to serve the way a patron gives to those seen as deserving. We don't serve as a superior, but as an equal, without regard to merit. Giving is intimately tied to receiving, and that back and forth is how the beloved community functions. We're not able to serve if people say, oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't need that. I don't want that. Um, it's a, it's a two-way street, and we'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks. So the second thing, first thing, embrace death. Second thing, embody service. The third command comes from the Great Commission that Ajua read for us this morning, to make disciples. In other words, multiply the effort. In all four Gospels, Jesus calls his 12 disciples right at the start of his ministry. He doesn't go off to conduct his ministry solo, even though that may well have been easier. He handpicks 12 others who were there to help him, to learn from him, and once they were ready to succeed him and take over the job, as they do when Jesus passes the job on to them at the end of John. Christianity is not the faith of Lone Rangers. It's how we ensure that any given ministry and any given church is still alive for the next generation. It's why we're here now after 150 years and the only way we will be here another 100 years from now. So that's the third thing, multiply the effort. Those three things, to embrace death, to embody service, and to multiply the effort, work in tandem through us to turn death into life. Any one of those things without the checks and balances of the others can lead to trouble. Without all three things working together, a church ends up in one of three holes. Lukewarm and stagnant, intolerant and prideful, or dead and closed. None are then capable of turning death into life. And the world each of them creates looks like, kind of like it looks right now, actually. <laughs> Those three things, embrace death, embody service, multiply the effort, are the topics for the next three sermons. But for the rest of the service this morning, we're going to try having a dialogue about them in some smaller groups.